Mike Shepard, ChicagoJazz.com. Welcome to Talking Jazz. We are live down here at the Chicago Jazz Festival. Our last interview of the day. We're going to make it before the sun hits us. I am here with Alejandra Urzagasta. Urzagasta, yeah. I, I knew I was close. And <laughs> yeah. I told you I was going to screw it up. So close. Sliding so, in. Well, that's how... That's how <laughs> We're both in jazz. We're so close, yet <laughs> so far sometimes. Anyways, I'm so happy we're here. He just got done performing his set, and it was with your band Flo. He just got done performing his set here on the uh, Promenade, the 3 o'clock slot, killing band, promoting your brand new album, Subject to Change. Now, many of you know Alejandro. Many of you know the guys in his band as well. George Flutus, Dennis Carroll, and from the great north, Bill Carruthers came in, an incredible piano player. So, first of all, how was it performing here at the Chicago Jazz Festival? You know, it's like any performance. You think you know what to expect, and then there's always something that changes or some unexpected occurrence, and we just had a wonderful time, and it was a great crowd. I couldn't have better weather. Uh, the sights are awesome. The sound was good, and we just went with it. It was wonderful. You know, and let's talk a little bit about this. So, first of all, the band... You guys had you guys have played a lot together. I mean, maybe not with Bill, but I know George and Dennis have played a lot with you over the years, right? Yes, we have. You know, they kind of brought me up. We did a recording with the great Jody Christian, who is somebody that we all looked up to and did an Urban Intervals back in 2012 and another recording. So George and Dennis have always been probably the first people to call for any any event because they're, they're well. They're, I mean, first of all, they're smoking. They're killing players, but they're also really giving too. I think, right? So, I mean, when you when you connected with them, that had to be something that was really uh, a, a great opportunity for you because it was just like to be able to play with a rhythm section and you being a guitar player. It's got to just open up a, a whole wide range of opportunities as playing wise. Meaning, you don't have to worry about the rhythm section being together and they know how to play with themselves, but also with you too, right? You can throw just about anything at Dennis and George, and they're gonna catch it. And if they if they don't, they're gonna try. Right. And they've been they just did a weekend with Johnny O'Neill. You know. Yep. I, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as a guitar player, so let's talk a little bit about this recording. Subject to change. Um, why the name Flo for the band? My last name, as you've noticed, it can be a little bit long. I have 18 letters and when you put it all together. I noticed it. Them, yeah, <laughs> it's right here. Everybody does. I think it was even on my junior high diplomas. So I thought I want to do something also that's not just about me because Bill's such a strong composer and pianist and has always been a real inspiration. But by the same token, Dennis and George are too. So I figured, hey, you know, why am I going to call it my own thing? and just push that forward. Let's come up with something a little more simple and something a little more impactful and, and, and appropriate for that group. Well, and that, that, that name really describes the music, right? I mean, that's the whole point of it. That's the entire point of it, yeah. absolutely. So let's talk about the music now. Are these all original compositions? Not all of them. There's uh, one from Jackie McLean. We do Little Melanie. We do a Thelonious Monk song on there, Nutty. We did uh, Harry Warren's I Had the Craziest Dream as a slow ballad, which was a lot oh, of fun. Oh, nice. We yeah. just pulled that one out. Uh, and then uh, Jody Christian's song, Chromatically Speaking, was something we did kind of an homage. But other than that, they all are uh, our songs. My songs are Bill's. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and as far as this coming together and putting the group together, um, I mean, how does how does something like this come about as far as selecting the tunes, getting the repertoire together, and really focusing and dialing in? Because with Bill being all the way up north, there couldn't have been all that much rehearsing. There couldn't have been all that much. There was none. <laughs> well, that answers the question. Yeah. We showed up in this. I called Bill. Or I, I actually Facebooked him. Yeah. And he, I asked him, hey, are you interested in doing a recording? Thinking, well, you know, might as well try. And right. he said, yeah. And so then we met in the studio, and we did one one version of diminished returns and i think the second actor the first take but the second time we played through it it's the recorded version no kidding and we just rolled from there and did a did a couple hours took a little break and then came back and we really didn't do the, the whole thing of i want to hit this like that or just more of let's see let's see what we can do here because we all we all know that we can play right we all know that something's gonna as long as we're listening and we were sitting in the same room Maybe one baffle and turn on the tape. Let's let's do a take here. Let's see how that is. All right, great. Move on to the next thing. That's almost like a well, it's old time style of recording, basically, where everybody's in the same room, right? I mean, but 
as a guitar player, how important is it when you're recording? I mean, is that a better way to record as a guitar player because you can feel everything a little bit more? Yeah. For me, I have a hollow body, Hoffner, right. Jessica. And the feel of stuff is very important because it's such a percussive instrument. Mine's got a particular kind of finish. We'll get into that some other time. <laughs> Maybe when it's a Chicago jazz guitar. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> but you can feel it's, it's – you're a drummer. I mean, right. it's, it's almost like a snare drum. Okay. Where you can hear that little ripple effect. And so I really want to hear that as well and feel that. And I don't want to manipulate that through effects and stuff. So being in the same room with everybody. And, you know, Bill doesn't like headphones. And I oh, try, really? Yeah. And I, without headphones, most, it, it, it seems to communicate better. Because now we're, now we're all kind of in tune and we're listening. Almost like we're up there. Just playing in the moment and then trying to see what we can all generate together. And not put one person in front of another so much that like you're not listening anymore it's all about listening yeah you know well, you know and that and that's one of the biggest things i think because i mean you've probably recorded a lot of other recordings over the years whether they're your own or as a side man on projects and you get in those separate rooms and it comes out and uh, it sounds great but then you know that the live gig is going to be like probably way more energy than what's on that recording and it's so hard to recreate it when you're separated. So do you feel like with this kind of with this recording, it really got to the to the point of what you wanted to create because you were all in that room together and playing live and, and pushing the envelopes? It, it did. And I just had to say, I did do a recording with Mark Pompey and Jody Christian some years ago called High Fly, which. Oh, I remember that one. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and unfortunately, you know, Randy Weston just passed. Right. This was. But. Jody was somebody who said, you got to play everything like it's the first time you play it. Yeah. And I think that stuck so, that's so back in my brain and my subconscious that that's really how this came about when it was, oh yeah, play live together, you know, play without headphones, try to really keep, keep it fresh. Yeah. Keep it moving and not always loud. Right. You know? Right. Delicacy and being, being uh, kind of emotional or being quiet. It's very and mellow. That's a very hard thing to do to keep the energy up and keep listening, keep the attention going. But that's really what we're all trying to do here. You know, it's interesting when you say play quiet because a lot of the times, whether I, you know I'm playing on a gig and we're playing somewhere and it's it, we got to dial it back a little bit, yeah. or you're going to listen to people do that. When they really are into it and they know what's going on, when it gets quieter, it almost gets more intense. Mm -hmm. It almost get, it gives it that push because everybody can hear what's going on and they're really focused on what's happening. So that was kind of like what happened with this then, right? I mean, you guys are probably blowing too, but I mean, it was probably one of those things where that intensity built up because you had to kind of control the situation because you're playing live. It builds and it's not manufactured in a way where it's like, okay, here's here's the end of the solo, so now let's go ahead and it was more okay. What are we gonna? What not? What are we gonna do next? But like, where can we go next? Yeah. You know, how can we move this forward? And if something didn't come out, we wouldn't use it. Fortunately, mostly everything came out like within the first two takes. Is that amazing? It really is. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And every first of all, it came out, but then everybody was happy with putting it out. Because, you know, sometimes that doesn't happen. They're like, yeah, it was cool, but, you know, I don't know. But it seems like everybody was really happy with the whole the whole process of this whole thing, huh? You know, you make a, a real interesting point because that is it. And, you know, the idea is, is, okay, well, do I structure this in a way where we do a rehearsal or maybe we do one day and then come back in a couple of days and see and listen to it and stuff like that? But then it's like, no, you know, maximize the potential by getting rid of the waste or making the room for that and just make sure that like, you know, everything is counting at that moment. And, and if it doesn't work, at least you're trying. But most of the time, yeah, every, we, I mean, we had 22 songs. There was, okay. Yeah. Out of, out of two sessions, yeah. there was, you know, 22. Wow. And that, that's a, that's a 74 minute uh, CD. And there's 12 tunes on there's here. So I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, there's a more in the, in the can. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, so let's talk a little bit about your background so that the people that are watching this or listening to us on the podcast might not know. Uh, did you? Where did you grow up? Did you grow up in the Chicagoland area? Or? Mostly I grew up in uh, St. Charles. My family moved here, Blizzard of 85, from Han in Hanover Park, but we moved from Michigan. Uh, originally, I was born in Iowa, Waterloo. My dad worked for John Deere. Okay. And my, uh, my, my mom's from Chile. My dad's from Bolivia. I'm first-generation American. Wow. Uh, and we moved from Iowa to Michigan to Chicagoland, uh, and then... I went to school and was out in St. Charles and played guitar, you know, had friends, you know, okay, you play drums, I play guitar, let's do some Motley Crue, you know, or whatever, <laughs> whatever it was. I think we got into like more metal. 
And yeah, hey, man, that's that's me too. That's you know, where I was. I grew up in the '80s, late, you know, early '80s, and then '85, '86 in high school, and it was Motley Crue, Iron Maiden, you know. I, yeah, I mean, my first gig, I think we did Van Halen, Pound Cake. I had to drill, <laughs> and like I had to do the Randy Rhodes solo from Ozzy. Oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I was like, <laughs> like the girls are really gonna love this, but uh, that grew into something where in eighth eighth grade, you know, St. Charles, we were fortunate to have a very strong jazz program. Now, I don't know if that's just because of the proximity with Ron Modell, who was over in NIU. Right. NIU right. over there for Reed was over over there, who I ended up studying with for a couple years on a scholarship. But we had uh, Jeff Childs and a really strong jazz program, and they took me in as a freshman. And I think that that singularly might have changed my life, not knowing, because right. thinking, wow, this is a class. I can hang with some of my friends. We can play. We can play well. You know, some funk. Sure. And I could play my Jimi Hendrix Red House, and it's cool, maybe without distortion. But now, now I'm learning seven chords, and we're listening to Count Basie and Thelonious Monk, and then Joe Pass, and it's like, well, I hope I can play like that someday. That, that's the thing, right? Because you're listening to, like, the metal and the rock and everybody that all the kids and everything like that. And, I mean, you're totally into it. And that's really good playing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that at all because that's, like, some killing playing. A lot of those guys are, like, smoking players. But then all of a sudden you hear, like, a Joe Pass or probably a West Montgomery, and you're like, these guys are taking something to another level here, right? Yeah, a absolutely. You know, I didn't hear West till later okay. you know, when I was in college. Uh, actually, going into college, I learned a whole bunch of stuff off of uh, at Half Note. Going but right before I went yeah, to NIU, yeah. I was on the road uh, playing bass uh, with a band that was on a small uh, small subsidiary of Virgin Records. Okay. And I toured, and I used to go in the hotel room afterwards and practice my uh, what for no blues. And if you could see me now in Unit Seven licks, and then oh, wow. when I went to school, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm all about this. But it, it, exactly, you know, and I think that the the chance that m the teacher uh, Jeff Childs took on me was he saw me playing this other stuff, and he's like. There's something there. Yeah. Let's give this guy a chance. And it worked out. It yeah. worked out for me, at least. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, a lot of people need that little nudge, right? Yeah. They need that little nudge, and then they need a little encouragement and somebody to kind of take them under their wing and, and you know, not to be like, hey, get out of here, you stupid kid. Like, here's the deal. I can tell you're serious about this and push you, right? Yeah. And I think at NIU at that point, because I have, I have uh, other people that I know that went to NIU and got degrees and stuff, there was that – that that era where there was that push you know where and there was a lot of people there playing i think right when you were there when, when i went to school there yes there was but even before then here in niu at the uh, theater at uh, in on the high school we have we have a really nice theater out there delora a cultural north uh -huh. i think wdcb does some concerts there yep maybe you've been out there too um and i'd hope so because it's like the, the place to go to out in the area uh, so NIU would show up, and I remember oh Jeff Hill, Dave Ness, who still you know he has that album Grooveness. He was my teacher, but he's also in the NIU band. Uh, Tom Hipskin. Yep. Uh, T Tito Carrillo. I remember hearing uh. Tito, <laughs> and being like, wow, you know, yeah. this is. And in the theater, you know, you hear the the reverberation, and you hear all the language, and think this is this is something. Sp I'm not getting this when I'm going down to the Cabaret Metro. You right. Know? <laughs> right. <laughs> this is not the same. <laughs> and, and and being exposed to that and going forward with it, and, uh, yeah, def. Definitely, it's, it is that little nudge. And then when I went to school, I think even Alex Austin, who's on stage right now, mm -hmm. he was at Northern. You know, Greg Ward was coming in. Uh, yeah. Kyle Ashey was there. Pete Benson had just left. I mean, there was a whole bunch of people there because Fareed and a lot of the faculty at Northern, I think, realized that if they want to make a program that makes it viable for people who are strong musicians to come here and nowhere out in the middle of the cornfields of DeKalb, where you only got like two Mexican restaurants, and I worked at one of them. But <laughs> we got we got to we got to bring these, and so they they started giving out half scholarships to people. And That's huge. It, it, that it just really, changes the whole ball game at that point. Maurice Brown was there, you yeah. know. There was a lot of a lot of people who ended up being there and staying there and graduating, and who are now I see around here. We all kind of know each other. Yeah, I mean, and and that natural flow too, right back into Chicago. Because you're you're at NIU and probably on the weekends you're coming into Chicago, you're making the trek. <laughs> I had a Portuguese teacher because I took Portuguese class, and he said, you know, if you if you miss one more day, I'm failing you. And I had a gig with Von Freeman on Tuesday, and class was Wednesday night. You're doing the apartment lounge. The or apartment something? lounge. Yeah. Mike Alamana was was graceful enough to let me sit in and then play with Von when he would go out of town. Von. So I was doing a month, every now and then I did a couple more weeks, and this was one of those times, you know, 
Von Freeman had asked me to play at the new apartment lounge, and I had this teacher sweat. If you miss, you know, class at nine o'clock on Wednesday, and I thought, hey, you know, I'm going to school for music. Right. And, and not only that, I mean, Von Freeman was is a is a legend. That was probably oh one yeah, of the, no, yeah, the best. Best well, and it would go till like three o'clock in the morning. It was awesome. I mean, you yeah. could you could see you could see Roy Hainson at the bar. Eric Alexander would come in and play. Chris Potter, I remember him coming in playing like twenty choruses on "There's No Greater Love." Steve Coleman, Roy Hart. I mean, everybody would be there, and people who like are na- aren't national national people, but who you could you'd hear them and think, "Wow, you yeah. know, T- Teddy Thomas, you know, Lenny Lynn, Margaret Murphy, who's now at the yep." All, all these people, all all there every week. Yeah, I mean, what a learning opportunity! I mean, you're going to school, but that's where you're learning, right? I mean, that's that's where you're figuring out what works and what doesn't. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, I actually um, I didn't graduate from NIU because I decided I want to go to school in Chicago, and I was driving back three times a week, and that ends up being nine hours of traveling. Yeah. <laughs> and I was working, and I decided to just transfer. So I transferred down here because I started playing with people. You know, Cameron Fifter took me in a group called Marco Polo. I, I remember know. Marco Polo. Yeah. Sure, yeah. We did the fest here in 2012. Yep. Uh, and then I started playing with Taku Akiyama and, and Nori. If you remember that group, we mm-hmm. did. We were here with Josh Abrams in, I think, 2005 or 26, 2006. So meeting all those people was, to me, that was... That was the the, lear- the learning, and then obviously you know meeting Bobby Broom and hearing Bobby Broom and Ron Perillo, right. you know, and getting, then getting a chance to play with them, and that's that's where it started going over to George and Dennis, and then I was like, Dennis, you got to hear this piano player, you got to come down here, Alejandro or Ali, uh, Jody, you know, Jody's the real yeah. thing. Sit in with us. That's yeah. how it happened, you know. We're really? riding with them. Yeah. He's like, here, make sure you bring a little amp, and, and we'll have you sit in, and they let me sit in on the last tune on Solar. Uh, it was a great band. Uh, Scott Burns, Julie Wood, uh, Burgess Gardner, and Tony Walton, Dennis, and Jody. South Shore Cultural, uh, our 63rd Street Beach. Oh, yeah, sure. And, I mean, from there, it's just a, 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 a tumultuous or non tumultuous, that's the wrong word, a flow of things that was just kind of kept going forward, and every time it was something different and new. And we just started playing together. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, and, that, and that's the thing. You're lucky because you got to play with Jody. Because, I mean, you know, there's a lot of kids now that are coming up that won't even know. They'll, they'll know him from the records, but they won't know uh, from playing with him. And he had such a delicate touch, but he swung so hard. Yes. It was, it was nah, just crazy. And he couldn't have been a nicer guy. And just a just a just kind of like a quieter-sided guy. You know, I remember John Young. Yeah. And that's the same kind of thing. He's this monster player. But if you talk to him, it was just like, you know, hey, how's it going? You know, I mean, it was like. Hello. But then when he sat behind the play, be behind the piano, I was like, whoa, man. You know, so, I mean, it's so great that you had that opportunity to play and connect with all these guys. That's that that's that earlier era to the new era. You know what I mean? That that yeah, bridge. It is. And it's still it's still there. And I think that we got a lot of people who ha- are part of that bridge to making the music. You know, it's different when when we're playing like you were asking about the recording. It's different when we're playing this kind of music because we're so responsive if we don't close the doors. Right. And we have to hear those instruments. So, like, you know, playing with a drummer who knows how to play the drums at a volume and knows how to just get get in there at the right beat, that will teach you how to play your instrument. You right. know, or like a bass player. When you're probably back there swinging and a bass player is kind of a little tepid and not really getting in there. Oh, it's never happened. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's never happened. But, you know, oh, you know, you got to get in there. and you, That's the same thing with the guitar. We don't think about guitar like that because we see guitar in the cultural mainstream as something different. Yeah. But that's what I learned from from them, and you know that's what I keep working on all the time. Well, and we should talk a little bit before we finish up here about the school that you run. So yeah. all of this kind of comes full circle, right? I mean, you're learning, you're going to NIU, then you're learning from the masters, then you're creating your own stuff and becoming a master, and now you're teaching and you you created this school, North Shore Music. Yeah. It's in Wilmette, right? NorthShoreMusic.com. NorthShoreMusicWilmette.com. Oh, NorthShoreMusicWilmette.com. Okay, tell us a little bit about that. How did that happen? Uh, you were probably just teaching, and then it kind of organically happened? or It did. Yeah. You know, uh, Lee Rothenberg, who's in Soul Message, uh, who we're now starting to branch into doing concerts. We're going to do a concert October 18th with mm-hmm. Soul Message at Kenilworth Assembly Hall. That's Thursday, October 18th. He, he recommended me for a job, and a year into it, the owner said, hey, you can have, you can buy the place, you can have the place, or I can close the door. And I thought, well, you know, might as, might as well do it. Yeah. And so I've been doing that for about two years now. We're, we're now North Shore Music. We're located on Linden Avenue over by the Baha'i Temple and Alchemy Coffee in Wilmette. We offer a guitar, bass, drums, piano, voice, 
band camp, saxophone, show l- lessons, free trial lessons, you know, all, all, all this stuff. But the website's NorthShoreMusicWilmette.com, and you can see all the information there. And it's all levels, all ages. It's it's an open experience thing because I really, really, being a performer and getting the chance to perform again at the Chicago Jazz Fest, and, you know, and you're talking to being a performer tells me that, you know, there's got to be something about taking the, the music from the lesson room to the stage. And that's at any level. I mean, it's not to say that a novice can go up and just, you know, bang on, but give them the skill set to go up and perform, have have fun, you know, grow, be confident with it. Because right. we know, you know, there's a great classical guitarist from Spain in the 1800s, Francisco Torrega. Love classical guitar for he taught me a lot of that. And he was apparently a little shy. I mean, I, I don't know. I didn't live in the 1800s. I don't know if he did either. But, <laughs> I'm know, not that old, man. All these beautiful compositions yeah. and not concertizing that much. You know, and I always thought, wow, you know, why why would you? I guess that's a choice a person makes. But let's try to do something where we can bring the stage to, pe- to young people and even adults. There's a lot of proficient adults out there who can play, and they just don't get the chance to. Right. N- the nudge. That's what they need. They need the nudge. And they need. I just find, and I'm sure you totally find this too, is that everybody, it's almost like just coming down here, right? I mean, at the jazz festival or what we're talking about as far as the education side, they're here. So maybe they didn't come down here to the jazz fest specifically for jazz, but since it's so easy to just walk in there and check it out, I'm sure a lot of people walked in, heard your set, went, who are these guys? This is really unbelievable because they were here and it was easy for them to do and they got that nudge because it was there and they walked in. So it's kind of like what you're doing where you're making it super easy. Just come on in, contact us, let's talk a little bit, figure out what you're interested in and see what we can help you with and, and go for it. There isn't like, like, like some big barrier and I think a lot of people have that problem with music in general, don't you? I do, I think so. I think the accessibility, especially now with the schools and the curriculum changing a little bit and even what we're, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to tell a young person, hey, Go be a musician, you right. know. I mean, we all we all have to do different things, and we all, but we all have that love there. And I think once you get that fire lit, at least you let the person, young or old, or, or young or on in their years, let them make that choice. And just like you said, having the chance to go ahead and see music. I mean, who, who gets to see Diane Reeves, even if for one song, you know? Hermio right. Lombabo, who gets to see all the great young Greg Ward who's here, you know, Dustin Lorenzi, heard him with Queen Co- Co- Fareed's on right now. Right. You know? uh, I mean, we, this, uh, Eric uh, Eric Revis is playing. <laughs> right, <laughs> I mean, right. You know, like, yeah. Okay. I know, it's, it's crazy when you and start thinking about we, it. We know, but I think people who like music or who like art or who just enjoy uh, activities that are rewarding and positively stimulating, yeah, check this stuff out. Here's the access. Go ahead, you know, go walk in. Don't be afraid. Go go check it out. Exactly. Well, you can check it out, NorthShoresMusicWillMet.com. Yeah. And then, of course, AU Guitar, AUGuitar.com. And you've got to check out this brand new recording, Subject to Change, Alejandro's brand new disc called Subject to Change with the band Flow. Flow, yeah. Sorry, I'm starting to get the, the sun's hitting me. I'm getting heat stroke, but that's all right. We're going to finish this. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Take a solo. No, I'm just oh no, Pat well, Martino ripped that up. Oh too my much. god! Oh my god! How about it? That recoil! Oh my god! We'll talk about that off camera. Anyways, I really appreciate you stopping in. It's so great to meet you in person. You're constantly on Instagram, on Facebook, obviously the website. So everybody check him out on all the social media platforms. Yeah, I'll follow you back. You definitely. Know, definitely. I mean, seriously, we got to, it takes everyone, but it's a real pleasure meeting you too, Mike. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to your audience and your fans and what you're doing here is, is awesome. Man. Well, I appreciate you doing that. And of course, you got to keep us up to date on everything that's happening. October 18th, Soul Message with his uh, his school coming up. So get all the information at NorthShoreMusicWillMet.com. And Alejandro, thank you so much. And as I always say, because I always close the show out this way, hopefully Alejandro sees you somewhere at an upcoming performance meets you online, sees you somewhere on social media. And of course, if I don't see you somewhere in the next week or two, hopefully at some point, I will see you somewhere out on the scene.